Lord, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise this morning. For you are worthy, O oh God. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. We stand, O oh God. We stand upon your word this morning. And we say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing us here this morning. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercies. Hallelujah. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? If you are glad to be in the house, give the God a big shout this morning. Give God a big shout, a big note of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We worship you, God. We worship you. We worship you this morning. We worship you this morning. All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel, King of kings and Lord of lords. We hail you this morning, oh God. We lift up your name, Lord Jesus. We say, oh God, enter into this place uh, and dwell in our midst. Uh, we welcome you. Welcome the King of Kings uh, and the Lord of Lords. Uh, we welcome you. We welcome you. Uh, we welcome you in this place. Uh, we welcome you in this temple. Uh, we welcome you, sovereign God. Uh, we welcome you. We welcome you. Uh, we say, come uh, and dwell in our midst. Uh, come and have, oh God, uh, communion with us. Uh, come and take control. Come and take every heavy situation. Come and take every, oh God, heaviness of us. In the name of Jesus, we put on the garment of praise this morning for the weight of heaviness. We put on the garment of praise. We put it on this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We say thank you, Jesus. For what you will do in us, oh God, today. Let your will be done, both now and forever. On earth as it is in heaven. For Hope International Ministries. On earth as it is in heaven. For Hope International Ministries. Let it be done, oh God. We thank you, Jesus. We exalt your name. The psalmist David declared, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Are you glad to be here today? Are you glad to be here today? Am I the only one that is glad to be here? Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Hey. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I command my hands to praise the Lord. 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 I command, I command my hands to praise the Lord. 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 Sing hands, hands to praise the Lord. Praise. 
If you don't have crowns at all, if you have any tribute, any honor, any praise, we lay them at the feet of this great God, before whom angels bow, and all tongue must confess. 
Jesus, that he's Lord. So, oh, glorious Lord, we praise you this morning. Glorious God, we magnify you this morning. Thank you for who you are, the God of all the heavens, the God of all the earth, the God with whom we have to do. Thank you that you're not only some distant God, but you are God who is Father, so close to us, can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And this morning we come worshiping you, praising you for all that you are and all that you've done. We say to you be the glory and we lay our crowns. Any tribute, any honor, any praise, any accolade, we lay at your feet, O oh God, because that's where it belongs. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. You may take a seat. This prayer time has become to us in the presence of God and petition of this great God of ours. Psalm 77. This will be the psalm we reflect on as we come to prayer. It says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God. And I groaned and meditated on my, in my spirit. My spirit grew faint. You kept my tears from flowing, like you kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit passed. Will the Lord regret forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? And we stop there and reflect the psalmist Asaph, who in a time of depression, uncertainty about the God in whom he had put his faith. I just came back from a conference last night late and um, powerful conference. One of the speakers, a person of a church of 7,000, he has three campuses and it was a tremendous speaker and you know after the conference the minister was speaking there one of the things that came out even yesterday was the church of the living God seems to be because of COVID but even before COVID gotten into this sense of spiritual malaise We may even call it tiredness, downcast. So church attendance, we know, of course, of COVID for some reasons has dropped, but that's not the only reason. Some people, they feel tired of God. What they're expecting isn't happening. And somehow... They are not committed to this God because they want a quick fix. A quick fix. They don't come committed to, to hear the word. They want a quick fix and move on. And so, this pastor who pastors uh, a church, one, the one he pastors, about 7,000 plus. He has three, two services on a Sunday morning called, sorry, I shouldn't say 7,000. The church seats 7,000. He has over 20,000. I was saying, um, 
Oh yes, for the first time since COVID is opening today. 600 out of 15,000 that will come on a Sunday morning. People are more content to stay in line if they ever stay in line at all. There are, there are other interests. They're tired. I hope that doesn't get into our spirits that we see God as someone who has failed us and he's not worthy of our trust, our faith anymore. The psalmist says, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has he forgotten to be gracious? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld compassion? Question, question, question. Why God? Where God? Why? What now God? <laughs> oh, we need to know that God is for us, not against us. He's always working for our good, for his glory. So the psalmist says now, Then I thought, to this I, was, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. I'll remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I'll remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is there. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your mighty power among the peoples. With, you might, with, your, might, your, with your mighty arm, you redeemed your people. The descendants of Jacob and, and Joseph. Your ways, God, are holy. You display your power among the peoples. So as we come this morning, I'm saying, if you feel a bit tired about worshiping, coming to church, and the other things pulling you, remember the things of old, the God, what he did for you. I say, if God cannot do it for you, to whom will you turn? There's no other God like our God. And so the psalmist concludes, yes, he's a God of might and power, a God of miracles, not like pagan, pagan gods. And yes, we come together as a, pe as a people of God in worship. We must gather. We must gather. Not just be on Zoom forever or, you know, some other media platform must gather. And God is here this morning to meet us at the point of our need. Let's come to prayer. Is there a need that you, you want to lift up this morning for prayer? Anyone has a need? Yes. I want to thank God for uh, Sister Pat and uh, that she has gotten her nursing degree. Give her a big hand. We're going to pray for you this morning that God will keep on strengthening you. You know, it's no, no, it was no easy, easy path. It's not an easy road. But you stayed disciplined. Fought the good fight and you, you're here this morning. We're going to pray for you that God will keep on blessing and strengthening and giving a hope in the future for you and your family. All right. Come to the pastor, Pat, please. Thank you. Lord, we thank you for your servant, your daughter. Thank you for her great diligence in pursuing this degree that is not just about her, Lord, but it's about you and people, to serve people better. Lord, you've seen the tedium of the task of getting this degree, but you've given her the grace and the favor to battle all the way through to the end. For that, we thank you, Lord. 
You know, there's more ahead for her. We're praying that God's grace and God's mercy and God's favor would rest upon her and lead her father higher and higher and higher into the realms of accomplishment for your sake and glory. We bless you, Lord. As she honors you, so honor her. Bless her family. Bless her dear husband, Pastor Wander. Her mother who has come. Thank you, Lord God. May the blessings of God be upon the Abodakta family. Always and ever. For Jesus' sake. We pray, O oh God, for Mr. Patel, who was raise her hand. We don't know what the need is, O oh God, but thank you that you do know that need. And she's um, humble enough to say, I need God's help. And Father, you are looking for those people who are humble and those people who are in distress, those people who have a need, and they say, yes, we need God's help. And Father, we commit her to you this morning. We ask in Jesus' name that you who are rich in mercy will stretch forth your hand of mercy to her today. God, meet her at the point of her need where she cannot find help. Be her help, I pray to you, God. Be to her all that she needs today. Be her help, her strength, her provider, her healer, her everything, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We thank you, Father, and bless you to, 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 to this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask it all. Amen and amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hope International Ministries. I hope everyone is doing well. I would like to take a moment to, to welcome everyone who's watching online. Thanks for tuning in. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge our pastors, our head pastors, Reverend Dr. Trevor Grizzle and his wife, Dr. Maureen Grizzle, and our assistant pastor, Pastor Wanda Abadapi, and his wife, Patience Abadapi. We welcome any special guests worshiping with us today. If today is your first time worshiping with us, please raise your hand. It looks like we're all family today. The burden of the leadership of him is that all peoples, irrespective of their racial, culture, or ethnic background, will find a place where they truly belong as children of God. Hope is also creating a home away from home for people of different nations resident in the U.S., who need a place to fellowship and serve the Lord. Our vision is serving locally and reaching globally, and our 2021 theme is living in faith that conquers. Here are this week's announcements. Morning prayers continue this week from Monday to Friday at 6 a.m. There will be a women's ministry prayer and Bible studies Monday at 8 p.m. Bible studies are on Wednesday at 7 p.m. on Zoom and prayer session on Thursday at 8 p.m. There's also Sunday school at 10.30 before main service begins. At this time, I'd like to welcome retired Sergeant Frederick Bompuku for the Veterans Day presentation. At this time, media, if you're ready, you can play that video. a no-go. Oh. Good morning, church. Thank you, Pastor, for today. And I thank you so much for allowing veterans to celebrate Veterans Day in this church. Thank you so much. And I also would like to acknowledge some service members in the house today. We have uh, our brother, uh, Brother Jaffet. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I'd like to acknowledge uh, PFC uh, House. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to acknowledge some folks here. Uh, you'll be like, okay, I don't know. Brother Fosu is not here. But we have Sergeant Major of the Army, Pastor Trevor Grizzle. He's <laughs> <laughs> serving the Army of God. And we have a first Sergeant, first Sergeant, uh, uh, Maureen Grizzle. 
in the army of God. And you would know why as I'm going to scripture. And we have also first on here for the other brigades, uh, Pastor Wander. Amen, amen, amen. Yes. Yeah. Oh, the video is ready. Okay, one second. Maybe go on and stop the video. The quality is not good. Go on and stop the video, please. Okay, we go to Second Timothy chapter two, verse three to four, and that is what Paul said: "Join me in suffering, like a good soldier of Christ Jesus Christ." The, this message I call it "Call of Duty." Many, many say I have a calling. I have a calling. Are you ready to suffer? Because having a calling is not just like everything is going to be all gravy. The blessing of God, everything. But Paul is saying here, join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ, Jesus. And then verse 4 says, no one serving as a soldier get a tangle in civilian affairs. But rather try to please his commanding officer. Past Antipat, this just I'm no prophet, I need no, it just is just example. I'm just giving an example. God may come to Pastor Wander. He said, Pastor Wander, in July 2022, I want him in Thailand. And he doesn't know how that's gonna happen. And he comes to share with you. And you're going to say, we have children, I have an appointment, I have this and this. But God himself start planning ahead to get mama here, to get Pastor Wanda, start meeting some people from uh, Pacific in some area in Walmart, come preach in my church, and they start teaching him about. So he's preparing the stuff and get him even in a, 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 a realistic training, get him trained to be ready. The point I try to make is, as they say, so you don't entangle in civil affairs. Like those things is not going to stop you for accomplishing what God called you to do. Whatever God called. I remember when we got here in 2013. God did his work to find hope. So when hope is in place, so when I'm over there and not he will take care, hope we'd have my family behind. So God planned everything ahead. So to go back in a calling, be careful when you say, I have a calling. But some calling, training for the calling also depends where God is taking you. And realistic training, you see, uh, God say you don't just you have to read that spiritual warfare. You have to see and live that spiritual warfare. You don't have to see, read, read about the bleeding lady or all that stuff in the Bible. No, you have to see someone sick and experience all that stuff because you prepare for a mission. That's what we do also in the army. We prepare soldiers before the training. The mission come at headquarters and prepare the soldier for whatever they send it to you. You may go over there a year after but you have to go through tr training and get you ready to accomplish that mission. He said, everything, he said, not in civil affairs, rather try to please his commanding officer. 
In Christian here, we are also in the army of God. Paul said that, join in suffering as a soldier for Christ Jesus Christ. We are also in the army of God. So we are pleasing God in heaven. We are not pleasing people. And soldiers, as I used to be before, and uh, PFC Hush is there, and my brother Chaffin, they are pleasing the commander. So there's nothing can change. You cannot say, you have to leave and leave your family behind, but everything, God will take care of everything. And the army also is going to say, we have what they call family readiness group. There are people behind who's going to take care of your family. If you go, Sister Kewana, you'll be fine. You're going to be just fine, so don't worry about it. And I know a lot we call about surgeon. Everyone wants to see me surgeon, surgeon, surgeon. Surgeon is not a prestige name. Do you know seven me surgeons is about suffering? When you hear people say something, oh, I, I'm not trying to say someone, but someone may say, oh, maybe that's something you just you show it up. No. A surgeon in the United States Army is a soldier to start with. You came as a soldier, and you are in a leadership position. So everything that comes from my head, you have to train soldiers. Soldier, surgeons see a transformation. I saw a young man come. I had to teach him how to brush teeth, how to do a hair, get a haircut, how to dress, how to do. Private Falimo is what he went in as a 35. You, you were a little older when he went over there, and you saw it. Some young kid came from. You say, come here, soldier. Oh, no, oh, oh, oh. Where you came from? Oh, no. Oh. They look at them and say, so you have to teach. So basically, that transformation, that transition that come from home, let's make it like Sally want to join the army. And Sally go over there. They're going to see antipart on Sally. And surgeon going to remove the antipart on Sally by force. And to make Sally become soldier. And normally, it takes two years. And you see that transformation start happening. And you see that soldier start became different. And then now, soldier guy that chest I start talking. Yes, surgeon. Be like, when you came here, when I called you last time, you know sounding like that. In the army of God, we have pastors, soldiers. And do you know that they also are the 24-7 as a soldier in the army? If tonight, I hope I'll just give an example. If it happened one day, not tonight, one day it happened. Pastor Chris may get a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning. Go to St. Francis. He had to go. Pastor wanted me to get a phone call while the last year home needs help in homework or something. The phone call, they say you're not pleasing people. You, you please your commander officer, pleasing God. Go. He has to stop everything. He has to go. Because it's always based on a mission. It's not like civilian, they look at stuff on my own. Or that's, no, it's based on a mission. A surgeon is a non-commissioner officer. There's a creed. That's every surgeon, when they graduate, they have to say, when they graduate, I'm going to read some part of that creed. He said, my two basic responsibilities will always be uppermost in my mind is accomplishment of my mission and the welfare of my soldier. soldier surgeon is always about the mission and the welfare of the soldier. Pastor is always about the, the mission, the responsibility, and a member of the church, a shepherd who had to, is about to take care of my troops, about to take care of my people. Yes, many are not doing that, even in the army, and even in the army of God. And another one say, an, a, a part of the creed say, I know my soldier, and I will always place the needs above my own. Selfless service. You place when you say you have a call, you have this. Are you ready to suffer? Are you placing the, the needs of others above your own when your children, when your wife needs it, when you just drop everything? I gotta go. It may not make sense in the eyes of man, but in the military, in the army of God, it, that's right. And then the last part of the creed say, one part of the creed say, I will always, I will communicate consistently with my soldier and never leave them. And inform. A surgeon is wide there to inform the soldier what's going on, what God is saying, and all that stuff is going. And they'd say, the last part say, I will be fair and impartial 
when recommending both reward and punishment. So that was just something to put in your ear to know what is a surgeon? Is this something uh, they just sit down, they don't do nothing? No. Surgeon is the first to come and last to leave. Surgeon is the one making things happen. It's not a prestige, it's not something. No. It's someone, God is calling, God call you, you have work to do because those people that you have to train, they're all about, about accomplishment and mission. And there's something also about the surgeon. As you grow, you start with a surgeon E5, and you grow E6, E7. The, the other name changed, but the, fir the first one doesn't change. You start with surgeon, you go staff surgeon, and you go surgeon first class. You go master surgeon, and you go surgeon major. So you always be a surgeon. Because that's the basic of being in the responsible in the United States Army and in the Army of God. As you can see, I'm not comparing, but you can see there are kind of military things going on both sides. So are you ready to suffer? I'm going to, Pastor, if you can allow me, I'm going to pray for all the service members around. Not just in the church, all over the world. I'm going to pray as they are suffering to please the commanding officer. Father God, I thank you for this day that many around, many are in the, somewhere in the Middle East, family behind, Father God. Many are in the training right now. Many are suffering, dealing with a new soldier just came in a unit. Who doesn't want to adapt with the military way? But I pray, Father God, that protects the troops in this country, Father God. And all over the world, Father God, people who raise their right hand and say, I will do. So help me, God. Father God, help them. I pray for the family. I pray for the children, Father God, that you be with them, Father God. That they will accomplish the mission. And they will carry on the responsibility. And they will please the commanding officer. And they will please you also, Father God. For every service member in this church, Hope International, Father God, I pray for success. I pray that, Father God, you give them boldness to lead their soldier. Regardless of what's going on, Father God, you give them wisdom. And they only not going to please the commanding officer. They will please you, Father God. Give them fresh oil, fresh anointing, Father God, to go. And then carry on the mission. We give you praise, Father God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sergeant, that was a good word. Uh, we just want to call on our brother, Jephthah, to also say something. Japheth, I'm sorry, Japheth. Amen. Time bong puku. You know, I couldn't have done it better than you've done it. <laughs> all right. Um, we all heard him. I want to say... Thank you to everybody uh, with the upcoming Veterans Day. I'm, I'm using myself as an example to let everybody know that Hope Church, everybody here behaves like the sergeant he just talked about. If you are in Hope Church and you are not benefiting from the deeds of the sergeant ship that everybody puts up here, then you've not voiced it out. I can tell you, Sergeant Bompuku has cut my grass before. I'm out there in for sale for a mission. My wife is pregnant. She calls me that the backyard is full. And the next thing I know, he was there cutting my grass. That's what sergeants does. I need a way to fix my car. You know, it's been in the garage. I call Mr. Ajiman. He ordered the part. One day early in the morning, he calls me, you are meeting me somewhere, and we are going to fix the car. He made it happen. Uh, amen. So that is what I'm saying. If you are here and you are not benefiting from it, that means you are not asking for it. Everybody here in Hope is a sergeant. Thank you. Wow. That's a good one. Everybody here in Hope is a sergeant. It means I'm also a sergeant. Thank God for that. <laughs> yeah. And it's true. It's true. I mean, we have a family that supports each other. Myself, I've benefited from sergeants. Uh, I've benefited from the Dr. Grizel and the family. But I've bought a piece. I've benefited from everybody, almost everybody here. And I want to say that it indeed is, is a family. Amen. And I thank God for our lives here. 
It's time for offering. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to feel the energy. It's time for offering. Yeah, one second. Before the, before the offering, I think Brother Joel, Brother Joel, is Brother Joel there? Please come give us the, the mission in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. We were supposed to do that before. But. Oh, thank you, Pastor. This is just one minute. Missions minute. We are going to Jamaica. I have studied the map of Jamaica. And we are going to land in the Montego Bay. Next Montego Bay is the uh, uh, Hanover Parish. Adjacent to Hanover Parish is Westmoreland. Jericho is in uh, Hanover Parish. So, the town or the village is a small fishing village that we are going is on the road to Jericho in Westmoreland. It's called Salmon Point. Salmon Point. We are going. I am ready. I know some of you got some boxes to put stuff in it. I know you are also ready. School starts in the middle of August. We have to go there and get things done before school starts. The same things that we've been doing at Nyami Vetre is the same things we're going to do over there. We're going to help the school build up. It's a village, so they probably need a, a roof repair, uh, some school supplies, and all of that. Those things that we can hire people over there to do it for us in two or three days, we're going to do that. We're going to raise the money from here. And we're going to go there and make it happen for the children at Salmon Point on the road to Jericho in Jamaica. Is anybody coming with me? I can hear you clapping. Put your monies together because uh, very soon we're going to tell you how much exactly it's going to cost. It won't be more than $1,500 because the round trip ticket alone is about $700. But we're going to make it happen for the children in Salmon Point on the road to Jericho in Jamaica. Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. Oh, one last thing. When you get off the flight at Montego Bay and you're going towards uh, Jericho on the road, you go by, uh, well, a slightly bigger town called Lucy. And Lucy, uh, that is where our senior pastor is from. He was from a small town, but Lucy grew and swallowed his town. So we will go and look for the remains of our senior pastor's residence. This is where our senior pastor grew up. It's also on the road to Jericho. Oh, pastor, I'm so happy and excited. And we're going to go to Jamaica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes. Let's call on the praise team. Praise team to lead us for the offering. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. It's time to give. Amen. We, um, we are thankful to God for the opportunity to give. It is the opportunity to be blessed. Amen. And so like we've been hearing this few days being preached by our senior pastor that we need to be good stewards also of the substance God has given us. Amen. And we give it to God because he... It is for the furtherance of his work. God really doesn't need our money to eat or do anything, but he had commissioned us to do work here on earth. And the giving shows our heart towards his work. Amen? So please, let's give so that his work will continue to be done here at Hope International Ministries. Amen. <laughs> Let's give cheerfully today. Hey, we are going up. We're going up together. We're going up to conquer. In the name of the Lord, we are going up. We're going up together. We're going 
going up to conquer in the name of the Lord. I am a warrior, more than a conqueror. I'm an overcomer in the name of the Lord. I am a warrior, I am a warrior, more than a conqueror. Talk defeat to me. Don't talk defeat to me. I am a child of God, and I've got the victory. Don't talk, no, no. Don't talk defeat to me. Don't talk defeat to me. I am a child of God, and I've got the victory. Do you have the victory today? I am a warrior. I am a conqueror, I'm an overcomer, in the name of the Lord. I am a warrior, I am a warrior, I am a conqueror, I'm an overcomer, in the name of the Lord. Do we have some soldiers in the house? I am a warrior. I'm an overcomer in the name of the Lord. Don't, no, don't talk defeat to me. Don't talk defeat to me. I am a child of God and I've got the victory. child of God, and I've got the victory. Do you have the victory? I am a warrior. I am a conqueror. I'm an overcomer in the name of the Lord. I am a warrior. I am a warrior. Oh, I am a conqueror. for your gift that your children brought before you today. We are praying, oh God, that you bless it. We pray, oh God, for the hands that will use it, that they will use it wisely in the name of Jesus. And we are praying, oh God, that you will bless the hands that give. Lord, those that give, oh God, sacrificially, we pray that you, oh God, will replenish in the name of Jesus. Bless each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, praise team, for that. Uh, just a quick announcement to the one that has already been said. Next week is our Pastors Appreciation Day. This is the day to celebrate our pastors, especially our senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Grizzo. We just want to encourage each and everybody to be part of this service. Uh, we just heard from sergeants that we are all sergeants here. And one of the things that he talked about was servanthood. And that is one of the things that our leaders here has demonstrated to us. They have been servants to us. Even though they are leading us, they help us in several ways. An example is Dr. Grizzo. Like, um, Sergeant gave an example that they can be at home receiving calls that you need to be at St. Francis. You need to be at this hospital. You need to pray for these people. It's not that easy. You have to ignore your family, whatever your family is going through or the request of them. And move on to pray for those people. It's not easy. I've experienced in Pastor Wanda's house, there was a time that Pastor Wanda called me midnight. That we had to go do some welfare somewhere. 
it's, it's, this is a time for us to appreciate our pastors. They are doing a very good job. So we just want to encourage you, if you're coming, come to support them. Come with the intention that this pastor has been, God has used this pastor to be a blessing to me and my family. And I'm also going to be a blessing to them. Hallelujah. Amen. Without much I do, I would like to call on uh, our assistant pastor. Today is communion. He's going to lead us through the communion. And as well, uh, he's the preacher man for today. So let's give it up for him as he comes in. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Praise the Lord. We want to welcome our first lady back from California. Great things happened over there. She would get the time to share with us uh, at the opportune time. Amen. I also want to um, thank you all who have been praying for them. And our pastor who went to Houston, he shared about it. Let's continue to lift them up in prayer for what God has called them to do. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, it's time for communion, and we'll go straight into the communion, and then um, I'll share with you what the Lord has uh, put on my heart. If you don't mind, if you have your Bibles, go with me to John chapter 6. Read from the verse 48. Now let me start from the 47. It says, most assuredly, suddenly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. That is certainty. If you believe in Jesus, you have everlasting life. Praise the Lord. I believe all of us here believe in Jesus. We have everlasting life. Amen. Isn't that good news to know that I have everlasting life? I didn't have to pay anything for it. Just believe in him. And for those who are hearing on Facebook Live, wherever you are, it's just that simple. You believe in Jesus as a savior, the son of God who came to die for you and took away your sins. It's that simple. You have the promise of everlasting life. Amen. Jesus continues to say, I am, one of the I am statements, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. Think about it. That you will receive bread when you eat, you will live forever. You know, I know people are... Uh, um, some people are working tirelessly for two things. It's two things, to, to pay, uh, to avoid pain, or to pay to have more pleasure. And actually, the payment to avoid pain is much more. But people don't want to die, so some people don't want to grow old, so they are paying much more for Botox and things and making sure <laughs> their wrinkles are taken care of. Whatever, a lot of money is being paid to avoid death. And then Jesus says, I give you bread. I am that bread. When you eat, you don't have to worry about death anymore. You don't have to be paying those big bucks. Actually, you can use the money to support spreading the bread to everybody who is afraid of dying. Praise the Lord. I am the bread of life. Continuous in verse 51. I am the living bread, not just a bread, but living bread which came down from heaven, if anyone eats of this bread, listen to this, if anyone eats of this bread, he or she will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Now he's explaining what this bread is. In case you are thinking about the bread you buy from Walmart, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It is Jesus himself, the flesh, he says. Now, this caused a little bit of a commotion. Who eats human flesh? And so the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, 
How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now this is the seriousness of the communion. Because sometimes when we come to communion, people don't want to take communion for whatever reason, you know, or that or that. He says, unless you do this, you have no life in you. The life is a living life. And so as you take the communion, you yourself are replenishing that life of Christ in you. Unless you do this, you have no life in you. You can be living, but living dead. You have no life in you, no zoe in you, that zest of life to live and see the supernatural power of God in your life. You don't have it. So if you don't have life, then you are a dead ground. And guess who roams on dead grounds? It's the devil and the enemy. They walk on dead grounds. If you've watched Lion King before, there was a place that uh, they told... um, Thin but not to go. And that was the dead grounds. And guess who were there? The hyenas. So you don't want to be a dead ground. No, you want to be where life is. Where when the seed falls on the ground, it germinates. Where there is water flowing. Fresh water. Life. It's in the blood. It's in the blood. Tell your neighbor it's in the blood. Life is in the blood. The blood. And it's true. Life is in the blood. But this life we're talking about is the life everlasting. It's in a particular blood. The blood of Jesus. Amen. So when we come together for communion, it should be a a celebratory time. It's time for life. It's time to get more life. Life into my body. Maybe there is some sickness lurking around in your bones you have no idea of. Do you know that some people get to know that they have cancer when it's at stage four? They have no idea. Remember pastor telling us a story of a friend he plays tennis with, went to the hospital for a routine checkup, and he has uh, uh, blockages in his artery. He didn't know. They had to sit him, take him right into the uh, the OR for operation, right there, just for a routine checkup. He did not know. So you have no idea what is going on in your body. But when we're taking of the bread and the blood, we can trust and believe that is bringing healing and life into our body. It is not just something we do because it's a ritual we partake of. This is reality, T- partaking of the body and the blood of Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise be to God. So don't get yourself out. It is for all who, the first scripture says, believe in Jesus. If you believe in me, you have eternal life. Then his bread or his body and his blood is for you. Maybe you say, oh, you don't know, I sinned, I sinned this week, so... Uh, I cannot take it. Have you asked for forgiveness? Do you believe the promise of forgiveness? That when you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you? If you believe that promise and you ask for forgiveness, he has forgiven you. He wants you to be part of the meal. Because he knows that if you don't partake of that, you don't have his life in you. And if you don't have his life in you, guess what is going to be happening to you? You will continue sinning because the enemy has his hand on you. So actually, partaking of it gives you strength and grace to fight sin. Please, don't ever, don't ever let the devil lie to you or deceive you when it comes to communion. It's that devil lying to you. He knows when you take it, you have life. And if you have that life, he cannot. He would have difficulty in having to put that sickness on you or do that thing that he, he, he causes you to do. So he would tell you, hey, don't take it, don't worry, forget about it. The same thing that gives you life, you ought to take it, amen?
So as we come this morning to the, this afternoon to the table, I want you to grab, I don't want to go on anymore. I want you to grab your um, communion elements. They're right in front of you. And uh, I think by now, if you're in this church, you know how to uh, work it. <laughs> you open it from the top. You free the bread. <laughs> And then uh, you do the next one, lift the top one up to free the, there you go, all right. See, some people are still working. Hallelujah. So Paul, speaking to the Corinthians also about the communion, reminded them of that night Jesus was betrayed. He says on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. After he has given thanks, he broke it to signify the breaking of his body. That would happen. But then it would happen. For now it has happened. His body has been broken. And he told them, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Let us break and eat. And in the same manner after supper was over, he took the cup, the cup of the new covenant, and he lifted it up and gave thanks. So we give thanks for the cup. And he says, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. Drink this as often as you drink this in remembrance of me. Let us drink. Then Paul says, when you eat of the bread and drink of the blood of Jesus, you're doing something. You are proclaiming the Lord's coming. You are proclaiming the Lord's coming. Not only that, What you're doing also is that you are affirming his promises in your life. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let us pray just shortly. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your body broken for us. And thank you for your blood shed for us. Thank you for the life it gives to our mortal bodies. And so right now we speak life. Life. That the blood will bring life. And every hidden sickness, we command you, in the name of Jesus, get out of that body. In Jesus' name, every heartache, Father God, every mental duress and distress, whatever it is, oh God, that is happening in our lives, that Father God is causing distress, we thank you that your body broken would take over our brokenness and mend us, O God. In the name of Jesus, let this blood that speaks speak on our behalf. May the blood speak healing on your behalf. May the blood speak deliverance on your behalf. May May the blood of Jesus speak strength on your behalf. May the blood bring life where there is deadness. In the name of Jesus, By the shedding of the blood, our sins are forgiven. May the blood bring forgiveness in every area of your life. May the blood restore hope where hope is lost. In the mighty name of Jesus, may the blood bring strength. And in the blood of the Lamb, you will stand strong above every circumstance. In the name of Jesus, you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In Jesus' mighty name. For it reaches to the highest mountain, and it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, oh, the blood that gives.
to share um, something with you. This few weeks of, of this uh, past month, our pastor has been sharing with us on um, stewardship. And as I've been um, following and meditating, the Holy Spirit shared sharing something with me. So he's going to share with you some of the things that the Holy Spirit has been sharing with me on, on this. Amen. Um, so, can you open your Bibles with me, if you can, to the book of 1 Corinthians? Chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. So it reads, let a man or a woman so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Keep that in mind, stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards or, or of stewards that one be found faithful. One be found faithful. Amen. I want to talk about stewardship, faithfulness to the promise of God. So, some of us here, I mean, already understand what stewardship is. You know, there are those who have committed their monies to some people to manage for them. Uh, they trust them, so they committed their uh, what they've worked for, that manage it for me. Some have committed their jobs, factories, whatever it is to people. 
if you are Ghanaian, you have to be sure who you commit that to. <laughs> Anyway, God is good. <laughs> so they trust the people that they would take good care of whatever they have committed to them. And that they can be rest assured, be in peace that they're working so hard here in the United States and sending stuff to them to take good care of. And they take good care of it. That chocolate doesn't look like it. <laughs> it lands in the right place. Anyway, so God has trusted us. We didn't make ourselves a steward. He, you don't get up to say, okay, I'm going to be your steward. No. The person, the owner, chooses you. So God has chosen us to be stewards of his mystery. And it's required that we be faithful. I want us to read the scripture in 1 Peter. Faithful to what? What has God committed to us that he wants us to be faithful? In First Peter chapter, sorry, Second Peter chapter, chapter one, we read from the verse one to four. I'm going to read in the NIV. It says, "Is Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect?" Peter, so it's not jiving for me. Second Peter, sorry. Uh, it starts with Simon Peter. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus have received a faith as precious as ours, to those through relationship. Remember, righteousness, relationship. Jesus, who knew no sin, took upon himself our sins so that we become the righteousness of God. Relationship. Through this relationship with Christ Jesus or with God our Savior, have received a faith as precious as ours. Then he goes on to speak upon them, grace and peace be abundant in abundance through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through, the knowledge, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us a very great and precious promises. So that through these promises, guess what is going to happen? Through these promises, we or you and I may participate in the divine nature. Through the promises that he has given us, we will participate, will share, will be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Amen. It is required of stewards to be faithful. Faithful to what? To the promise of God. The backbone of spiritual stewardship is the promises of God. And I'll show you through the scriptures. Now, we say, for God so loved the world. 
he gave his only begotten son. And there's a promise. Whosoever believes will not perish. A promise over there. You receive the promise. You partake in what God has for you. Without the promise, there is nothing for you. We partake of God through the promises, the precious promises he's given us. And I like the descriptive over the precious promises. And guess what? If you have a precious jewel, you will not give it to just anybody to take care for you. You would make sure that that diamond earring is given to a trustworthy person. The promises of God are precious to him. He doesn't just speak because he's having a good day or a good time. And so he just blurted out something. The word of God is God himself. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God and remains God. The word became flesh, reality. And we beheld the glory of the word that became. The promise that manifests. We see the glory of that word. Verse 14 says of John 1. So the promises of God are precious. Those are the things he has committed to us. That we ought to be stewards of his promises. Guard those promises. Why? Because for God to show his glory, it would have to be through the manifestation of the promise he has given you. That is how his glory is seen. So as I receive the promise, whoever believes in him have eternal life. And I receive that promise. The glory of God is revealed in me by having the eternal life. And why did I receive? Because I judge him faithful. And because I have received it, he then commits to me more of his promises. For he who is faithful in little will be given more. So when you are faithful in what God has given you, He will give you more of those precious promises. Praise the Lord. Realize that Peter said that these promises are given us so that through them we may participate in the divine nature. Now some of us think that, you know, when when we talk about the promises of God and all we go to is, you know... um, the money, money deal, those places that will make you feel good and all that, you know. Those are the ones we shout amen to. We shout amen to that. But when he says that he gave you a promise, consider it joy. When you go through all these things, because your faith is being tried, you're not shouting amen to that. Like our, our brother read today, uh, Brother Bompuku. Suffer with me as a soldier. We're not saying amen to that. Because I don't want to suffer. That is what we do. But for every word of God, when we receive his promise and are faithful in keeping it, we will see his glory. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 19. So the purpose of the promise is for us to partake in his divine nature. Who God is. And we say God is love, isn't it? We partake in that. In his loving kindness. We become that. It's not something we we stress ourselves to be. We partake in it. Partaking is like eating food. Come and eat with me. You partake of it. It becomes part and parcel of your life. 
God is peace, isn't it? We partake in that divine nature. God is righteous. God is good. We partake in that divine nature as we receive this precious promises. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'll read from the verse 19. And I'll read from the NIV still. Listen to this. It says, let me read the 18. But as surely as God is faithful, our message or, or the message of the promise of God to you is not a yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no. But in him, it has always been a yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. It is not a yes and no. No matter how many promises that God has made in his word, God has made to you and spoken to you, in Christ, they are a yes. God does not make a promise and then stops to think about it. Do I really want to do that? When it comes out of his mouth, it is a yes. It means that it has to be. Isaiah 50 says that as the rain and snow comes from above and water the earth and makes it bad forth and bring forth living things and trees and whatever you would think about that depends on it, so is the word of God that comes to you. So is the promise that God speaks to you. They are on a mission to accomplish his divine purpose. And guess what? It will not go back to God unless it goes with a mission accomplished. It would go back. The only time the word goes back is to say, God, I've accomplished my purpose. It is a yes. That means that you cannot doubt. You cannot entertain doubt about the promise of God in your life. If he said it, he will do it. You know the scripture in Numbers 23, 19 that says, He is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he will change his mind. If he promised, he will do it. And what he requires of us then, if his promises are yes, and he has committed them to you, he wants you to be faithful with it. Doubting and unbelief then becomes being unfaithful with the promise of God. Just like somebody commits their diamond earring or necklace and things in your hands and you are, I'm not sure, you know, this is that important, you know, and then just handle it anyhow. So it is when we have the word of promise and we are not sure if God will really do it. But we being good stewards then of the promise. The promise is the backbone of stewardship. Being faithful to the promise of God. Amen. It continues to say, for no matter how many promises of God, God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. The amen is spoken by us. And what is the amen? 
that is being faithful to the word. I say amen because I believe. I don't say amen because my circumstances have changed. I say amen because I believe the precious promise that has been given to me. So the Bible says, God promised me healing. By your stripes I am healed. I say amen, not because all of a sudden I feel good. I say amen because I'm excited to be faithful in holding on to that precious promise. Remember the story of Jesus after he had had great ministry on the other side of the river. And he gave just a simple promise. Because everything Jesus says is a promise. Let us cross to the other side. Let us cross to the other side. They heard the other side. He didn't say, let us see what will happen on our voyage. Let us cross to the other side. And they got into the boat. And Jesus knows he has given them his promise. So they will be faithful with it. So he wasn't worried what, what, what was going to happen. He knew a storm was going to rise in the midst of it. He knew the storm was going to rise before he told them, let us cross to the other side. He knows that you will get to that point that you will be sick in your body before he said, by my stripes you are healed. He knows that you would have a financial need to the point that you might be considering bankruptcy before he said that I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He knows all those things. Remember, he knows your end from the beginning. So before you got into that mess, he knew already and he says, I will deliver you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord, he gave the promise. So he knows you would have some afflictions before you got into the affliction. There is a promise, but are you faithful to that promise? For when you read John, it says, the word is a promissory that he has given us. Nothing is made that is made that will be made apart from the promise. So what the devil is after is not your joy. It's not all that you think is the end product. Is the word, the promise you are holding. He wants you to be unfaithful to that word. That at a point you begin to doubt it. Because the moment you doubt it, then you are not being faithful to the promise. So he comes in diverse ways, like the storm for the disciples. And they saw Jesus sleeping. The funny thing is the one who made the promise is sleeping. Knowing exactly what is happening. And like we said today, you know, sometimes hardship comes and we are screaming to God, God, what is going on? Don't you care that we are dying? Don't you care that I'm losing my house? Don't you care that I'm losing this? Don't you care that this is going wrong? And it feels like he's sleeping. Why is he sleeping? Because he's, he's I gave you a promise. What are you doing with this? Some people are problem focused. They are promise-focused people and problem-focused people. So you can be either promise-focused or you can decide to be problem-focused. Jesus knew that his promise, you can bank on it. So when he gives it, he really, you know, it, it is. It is. Let there be light and light is because when God speaks, it doesn't have to go. There is no council that have to decide whether we bring to pass what the Lord had promised. When He speaks, He is the council of the Word itself. The Word, the one who is the Word of the Lord, is the same is the the Lord of the Word. So you decide to be promise focused or problem focused. But if you are a steward, then you ought to be faithful to the promise. Holding on to that promise. And check who did that. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, uh, chapter 4. Just real quick. 
Somebody who was a promised focused person was faithful to the promise that was given him. Romans chapter 4. I will start reading from the verse 13. Watch this. It says, It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world. That's a big promise. You're going to be the heir of the world. It's not just uh, people of the world. This is huge. Just like God has given some people promises here. You look at it and you're like, ah, that's not me. You're looking back if he was speaking to somebody behind you. This is big. And this is to a man who doesn't have a child. It's ridiculous. Not just not having a child. They've been trying and 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 trying. And then the Lord says, the very thing that is not working for you naturally, I'm going to make you a heir of the world. Really doesn't make no sense. But you see, God is not there to make sense to us. He is God. He lives in the clouds of his own. And he says, the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing. The promise is worthless then. So being faithful to the word then gives the promise life. But when you operate with it as just something, then as a law, oh, well, you know, you treat it like a law, it becomes worthless. And faith then connects us back to where we started. Righteousness. Relationship with God. We have to have relationship with God. It's not something that happens in a vacuum. It continues to say, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. So where faith is, transgression doesn't work in those places. That's the, basically what he's saying. When you have faith and you are faithful to it, you are partaking in the divine nature. So transgression really does not work in those alleys. Praise the Lord. Therefore, the promise comes by faith. So that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offsprings. Not only those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. And this came way when Abraham was struggling to have a child. Where then? Now, if he had one or two then before he came, I mean, that will bolster his, you know, that, yeah, I got it. But he is trying and is not getting. And the Lord said, you want to pay your rent and your bank account is all dry. Nothing is happening. Your business is going down. And the Lord said, you're going to be building hospitals and orphanages. You look at your account and say, eh, for where? And watch God. He gives the promise in times that it would not make sense to you. It comes in your moments where you would want to take a second guess at it. Is this true? You would ask. But if you know who is speaking, you don't even have to judge its truthness. Because it's coming from the mouth of truth itself. Remember all his promises are what? Yes. So if it's yes, you can question its truthness. It is already yes. The Bible continues to read. And I like Abraham's story. It always encourages me. He says, I have made you father of nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead 
and calls into being things that were not. Now, this is Abraham having faith in God, receiving that promise, being faithful to the promise, but thinking of God in a way he had not experienced before. He that to to God had not yet raised anybody from the dead. So he didn't have this word that we have today to depend on. He had nothing to depend on. We have records upon records, testimonies upon testimonies, and yet we struggle. Here is a man who was called from his father's house his father was a some religious person, not serving God. God called him, said, go to the land I will show you. Where? I will show you. And then he just was going because he was being faithful to the promise. A steward of what God has said. It is required of stewards to be faithful. Because it is in our faithfulness of keeping that promise that God reveals his glory. His mysteries, like we read in 1 Corinthians, is shown. Without us having to keep that promise, the mystery would not be revealed. So Abraham judged God that is able to bring back life to the dead. And today we believe that. We have the story of Lazarus. We have the story of the widow of Nain's son. We have the story of um, the um, uh, Jairus' daughter. Those are just few ones that was recorded for us. So we have evidence that God can bring back to life. And then the second pillar that he was depending on Calling those things which are not as though they are. And that we have a lot of evidence about that. God said, let there be light. A light came. There was no prompting. He didn't go do anything and threw anything into the air to put some things together. He just said it and it was. And it beat. It beat. <laughs> Say it was, it was like he just, you know, he said it and he beat. <laughs> anyway, it's not in the English language, but he said, Make it work. You understand me. He said, say Communication is understanding. As long as you understand me, I have communicated. Because I can use a language that you don't understand. And so it might be a genuine, you know statement, but you don't understand. So really, I didn't communicate. So you know that even if it's not in the English language, it be it, you understood me. Thank you. I love that. Now watch this. Against all hope, Abraham was faithful to the promise. Against all hope, he was a faithful steward of the promise of God. That is when everything else was working against Abraham. When there was no way that in his human mind he could figure out what would happen. Everything else is moving south and yet he's watching north. His body was dying quickly and dead. And Sarah's gone totally. Womb I'm talking about. So watch what he says. Abraham... In hope, believe. Believe what? The promise. He believed the promise. That is being faithful. Being a faithful steward of the promise of God. Because God will try it. How faithful are you as a steward of his promise? You probably get to the point of giving up. How faithful are you to the promise that he gave? Your son, your daughter has to do with something and everything is falling apart for them. But God has given you a promise. Would you still 
hold on to that promise? Would you be a faithful steward of that promise when everything else is working against you? Against all hope. Would you in hope believe and hold on to that promise? Oh, I decree that God will give you grace this day. That when everything else is working against you, you will still hope in the Lord. Amen. Let me end this. It says that against all hope, he believed. So he became. He became. The word became for him just as it was said to him. Watch that. It happened just as God said to him. There was yes already in the promise. It doesn't matter how long it takes. The yes is waiting for its moment to manifest. I got news for you. The promise you have has a yes in it. And it doesn't matter how long it takes. The yes is waiting to manifest. It cannot be a no. Because there is no no in the promise. There is only a yes in the promise. If Jesus says yes, nobody can say no to it. Including me and you. There is a yes in it. When you say no, then you are being unfaithful as a steward of the promise. So today I came to encourage somebody. He says this. Without weakening in faith, he faced the fact that his body was good as dead. Since he was about a hundred years old and Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet, he faced the fact. He did not deny the fact. He faced it. He knew that this is the reality. But yet, in the face of the reality, yet the Bible says there has to be a yet moment for you. He did not waver through unbelief. He did not waver as a steward of the promise of God. In the face of reality, he did not waver. May you stand strong and not waver in the face of the realities. In the name of Jesus. The Lord calls you not to waver at the promise of God. He says this. That he did not waver at the promise of God. But was strengthened in faith. He was a promised focused man. When you hear any bad news. What do you think about? Promise-focused people will say, God, give me strength to trust you in this. Problem-focused people say, God, how can I get out of this? Think about it. Promise-focused people will say, God, because they have received the promise, give me strength to trust you in this. So to hold on to the promise, to be faithful to the promise, even if it takes years. But a problem-focused person is saying, God, get me out of here. Right now, are you there? What is going on? And when you are problem-focused, you are easily weakened by the storms. When you are promise-focused, you are strengthened by the storm. The same storm, but he does two different things in these two different people. One, it weakens them. The other, it strengthens them. Because they are looking at it differently. I pray that this day you will be a promise-focused person. That whatever comes your way, there are afflictions that will come. You might get sick. Something would happen. We hear a lot of things. It's not we are believers, so we are exempt from the the things of the evil of this world. No, we're not exempt from them. They do happen. Some people got COVID and they went through a lot of things. So yes, as a believer, you would face certain troubles. But that doesn't mean that you don't have faith. No, that doesn't mean your faith is being tried. God is checking which steward are you? A faithful one 
to the promise, it doesn't matter how long it takes. The God of heaven will surely come your aid. Amen. Chip Ingram said this, I end with the biblical stewardship is believing the promises of God, deploying the resources of God to accomplish the mission of God for the glory of God. And I just dealt with just the first one, the promises of God. And I pray that as you leave this place today, you will be a faithful steward of the promise. What did he say to you? Are you keeping it till the yes? Tell your neighbor, keep that promise till the yes manifests. Oh, come on, they did not hear you. There is a yes in your promise. Tell them there is a yes in your promise. Can you rise with me? Keep that promise till the yes manifests. We have our sister here, Miranda. We know we are believing God that she would walk, isn't it? And who says God has not given you a promise? He has, isn't it? You keep that promise till the yes manifests. You don't know what God is going to do, but we keep the promise till the yes manifests. You are not getting something that the Lord had promised you for. Keep that promise till what? The yes manifests. Because in the promise is the yes for the manifestation of that which you want from God. Your child is going through something. You are praying for them. It looks like they are going wayward. Keep that promise till the yes manifests. It shall surely manifest. The Bible says, rise with me. Jesus came to the pool of Siloam. And right there at the pool, everybody was there. People sick. He saw a man who has been sick for 38 good years. Believing God that something would happen. And you know what Jesus said? He says, 38 years is a long time to heal. Pick up your bed and walk. 38 years waiting for the promise of healing to happen to him. That is long time. Abraham, 25 years. God is able to. If he healed that man 38 years, God is able to do. Keep that promise till the yes manifests. Somebody decree with me, I will keep that promise till the yes manifests. Say it again like you believe it. I'll keep that promise till the yes manifests. One more time, I'll keep that promise till the yes manifests. I want you to pray right now. Just lift your voice and pray that God will give you grace to be faithful with the promise of God. Just the grace to be faithful. Pray for yourself that you will keep that promise. You will keep it with everything that is inside of you. Whatever promise the Lord has given you. Whatever promise he has said. Now watch, watch out for the storms. They would come around to make sure they get out. They take the word out of your hands. But keep that promise. You have to be a steward of the promise of God. Without being a steward of the promise of God, you cannot see the glory, the manifestation of it. Oh, Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for the grace to remain a faithful steward to the promise of God. That whatever you have said, I will keep it in the name of Jesus. And I will believe it. And I know that I will partake in the divine nature. In that God, your love, your peace, your grace will flow through me, God. And I will in this life fulfill your word to me. Every prophetic destiny in my life. Second prayer point, I want you to pray that you will avoid being a problem-focused person. Find every spirit and mindset of being problem-focused right now. That any area of your life that is given to being problem-focused, 
The moment you hear something, your adrenaline goes up high. You begin to watch the problem. We pray this day. Anybody here under that, under that duress of being problem focused, we deliver you in the name of Jesus. May the Lord deliver you from it and pray for grace to be promise focused even right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for the grace to be promise focused in Jesus' name. May this church be a promise focused church. That when we speak, we speak the promises of God. When we speak, we do not speak problems, but the promises of God. We will not lose the fact of the reality, but yet we will not waver at the promise that you have given. For every family here that is facing any challenge, anybody hearing me and listening to me right now, under the sound of my voice, on a live stream, or Facebook live, wherever you are, I speak to you right now that the Lord will turn the situation around. It is a promise. Hold on to that promise. Be a faithful steward of that promise. May this grace come upon you. May it come upon your family and your posterity. You receive that. Say amen. Put your hands together for Jesus. Thank you for the extra time to wrap it up. We are done. Thank you. You can shake somebody's hand and tell them, keep that promise till the yes manifests. Amen.